The Ganges is one of the greatest rivers in the world, but it is in trouble. Pollution on a vast scale has turned its sacred waters There's a tannery. into a stinking and lethal cocktail. Oh, God. <coughs> Hey, 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 hey. There's industrial waste. What are you stopping? Why are you stopping? The sewage from 450 million people. And all the while, so much water is being taken out that large stretches of the river don't flow for months. The Indian Prime Minister has staked his political reputation on cleaning it up. But is the Ganges, India's sacred river, still being killed by pollution? Dawn breaks over the Himalayas. And the glacier that is the source of the Ganges. A small stream emerges from a cave in the ice. Gaumuk. The cow's mouth, they call it. It is one of the most sacred sites in all Hinduism. As the river descends from the mountains, it gathers pace. Mar Ganga, it is known in Hindi, Mother Ganges, and it is an apt name. As I'll be discovering on this incredible journey, the Ganges has nurtured and supported the rise of India's great civilization. But this mighty river is under serious threat. Here in the Himalayas, the water looks pristine, crystal clear. Take a look at this. Now that looks good enough to drink. But actually, the studies show that even here, the waters of the Ganges are becoming increasingly polluted. As you travel down from the source, the issues become more and more pronounced. In the holy city of Rishikesh, the evening arti, an ancient fire ritual begins. It is performed in celebration and in worship of Mother Ganges. But there is an irony here. While hundreds of millions of Indians revere the river, they are also pouring their waste into it. It is a burden the Ganges simply cannot bear anymore. Ganges is uh, not mere water to Indians. It's like Mother and it's goddess. Sitting on the banks of Ganga, I can tell you that before we take bath in the Ganga, I think time has come to give bath to Ganga. People think Ganga can take care of my sins, can take care of anything. And they forget, yes, Ganga can take care of your sins, your pap, but not the pollution. And to me, if Ganga dies, India dies, if Ganga thrives, India thrives. Cleaning the river has become symbolic of an even bigger project. India's effort to lift its people out of poverty and become a modern world power. When Narendra Modi won a landslide victory two years ago, one of the first commitments he made was to tackle pollution in the river. He's promised serious money. He said he'll spend more than $3 billion over the next five years on his Clean Ganga mission. But delivering on his promise may be one of his greatest challenges. Because if anything speaks of the failure of governance in India, it is the abuse 
this great river is suffering. There's no better example than Kanpur, 700 kilometers from Rishikesh and the center of India's giant leather industry. India is one of the biggest producers of leather in the world. Most of the leather produced here is exported, much of it to Europe and the US. But the leather industry is very polluting. Toxic chemicals are used to soften and preserve the hides. Some are powerful carcinogens. You show me, down yeah. here. A local environmental campaigner takes me on a tour of what he claims is India's dirtiest town. Indian politicians have been talking about cleaning up the Ganges for three decades, but Rakesh Jaiswal says pollution has only got worse. <coughs> Take a look at this, and I have to say, it really, really smells here. These poor people have to live beside this drain. And looking down at the water, you can see it is black with <coughs> effluent, with effluent. It <coughs> really smells. And in fact, you, <coughs> there's a tannery. There's <coughs> Oh, God. <coughs> it's, oh, God, it's really powerful. Very strong. And what kind of waste do we have in here? Yeah, highly chemi <laughs> chemicalized and toxic water. Yeah. Wastewater coming from the tanneries. And you know, tanneries use a variety of chemicals, hundreds of chemi chemicals. Including really dangerous chemicals like chromium they yeah. use to soften the leather, don't they? Yeah. Chemicals oh, uh, having heavy metals and pesticides so as well. He says this drain, like many, many others, still pours untreated into the Ganges. It is a shocking indictment of the efforts to clean the river. So this is where that awful drain, and you can still smell it here, that drain runs down into the Ganges. It's very disheartening. When I started 20 years back, I used to see the river which was in a better position. I have only seen the situation worsening from bad to worse. And you can see the pollution in the river. It's killing the river. The man in charge of the Prime Minister's Clean Ganga mission acknowledges deep-rooted problems do need to be tackled, but he says progress is being made. They didn't uh, use the law to bear upon the industries in a manner that was really required, that was desired. Why not? What was going wrong there? You can say corruption was uh, part of it. When we did survey, we found that there are about 444 tannery units in uh, Kanpur. When we saw the license, we found that there are only 267 number of licenses. Right, Girish, yeah. can we choose the tannery? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, we can choose. He sends us out with a team of pollution inspectors to demonstrate that things are changing. Hi, sir. Hi, yeah. Hi, yeah. Pollution control. Oh, pollution control, come in. Whoa, this is a bit different. Mm. This does not look so good. Yeah. Hello, sir. Salam alaikum. So look, he's stopping something happening down there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look at this. What are you stopping? Why are you stopping? Who is in charge of this place? Yes, sir. Who is it? How many days? How many days have you left this? One. Four days. Four days. Four days. Four days. There's four days of flesh. This is where they strip the flesh from the hides, and there's four days of flesh. That is just disgusting, and you can see the flesh just running down the machine there. There are huge puddles of water, and the water has that distinctive blue color. So that looks to me. It's blue because yeah. there's chrome in it. Yeah. And there's hides here that clearly have been treated Many with the chrome because they're blue as well. 
This does not look so good. That tidy. That must this, tidy. This yeah. does not look tidy at that all. What dog. he looks disgusting. Yeah. So he says this drain is connected to the treatment plant, which he says is just down here. They're going to take us. We have to literally wade through these hives, and they're all swollen and bloated. Really disgusting. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh. How do you get across? Okay, okay. Oh, man, it's like walking on rubber. That is disgusting. Here are untreated hides. This is the raw hide. But everything seems jumbled together. Ah, yes, you said to me that segregation separation. Segregation is, is, is required. Is there any segregation? No. Here? Almost a hundred tanneries have been shut down, but I'm shocked that somewhere like that place is still yeah. operating. It needs some improvement. I some guess. improvement? Yeah, they need some improvement. A lot yes, of improvement. A lot of improvement. I mean, it was yeah. frankly disgusting. Mm. And we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have some action against it. What okay. action will you take? Do you imagine this place will be closed? I think I, I'll try. I'll, I'll give the recommendation. To, to close it? Office. Yeah. You're going to be saying close yeah, this yeah. place? Yeah, sure, there. sure, sure. And there are other pollution problems here in Kanpur. The environmental campaigner has somewhere else he wants to take me. So Rakesh has brought me to the outflow of the main effluent treatment plant. So it treats sewage and industrial waste. And just take a look at this. So let me just remind you, this is the treated water. The government admits the existing plant can only cope with a fraction of the waste from the tanneries. And guess where this water goes? That's right, onto the fields. It is used to irrigate 2,500 hectares of agricultural land. And the problem isn't just what's going into the river, it is also what is being taken out. The livelihoods of literally hundreds of millions of Indians depend on water from the Ganges. That's because irrigation is crucial to farming in what would otherwise be a virtual desert. Whoa, it's actually relatively easy to get water here. You don't have to dig that deep, although I must say it is pretty hard doing the digging. Can you just take over there? Cheers. What they've done is they've dug a, a hole about 20 feet, must be seven meters deep. And now they've dug a, a tube down and they've got to wait the pounds down, digging deeper and deeper until the idea is they hit the water table. They've put an electric pump into the wellhead. So it certainly is working. And this is the water coming through. And of course this, comes from the water table around here, but essentially this is this is Ganges water, which is why the amount of water the farmers are taking is such an important issue. Well, that was quite interesting, and I'm joined by Rajesh, who works with the World Wildlife Fund. Now, what limits are there on how much water farmers can take from wells like these. At present, there is no limit to how much water farmers can use. They can use as much groundwater as they like. The government doesn't charge them anything. The only cost is the price of the diesel. Only for the diesel. So it's just how much, how much it costs to take the water out. That's the only limit. But why is this an issue for the Ganges? Because they can very easily draw out the water from the river. So all the water that farmers yes. use across these vast Gangetic plains, yes, yes. all that water is essentially yes. water being taken from the supply to the Ganges. Yes, yes. So you've got less water in the river. Yes, yes, yes. Because they are extracting through the groundwater. Uh -huh. The more they are pumping from these tube wells, the more they are taking from the Ganges. Farmers are a crucial electoral constituency, and over the years, politicians have attempted to buy their favour 
by offering incentives to install pumps. The result has been water-intensive farming practices. Groundwater levels have been falling dramatically and so has the flow in some parts of the Ganges. But work by the World Wildlife Fund has shown it is possible to get farmers to use less water. Instead of flooding whole fields, they now limit water use by using a series of dams. The amount of water we use now has gone down by half. As a result, we use less water and get more profits. And the crops are also good. So do you think other farmers will begin to use the, the water-saving measures that you've begun to introduce here? Huh? Yes, everybody is doing it. It makes sense. We get more profits and cut our carbon emissions too. A few hundred kilometers down the river, we come to one of the greatest cities in all India, Varanasi. Varanasi is one of the oldest continuously occupied cities in the world. People have been living here for more than 3,000 years. It is the holiest city in Hinduism, but is also another huge source of pollution. Cleaning the river means addressing ancient practices like riverside cremation. Hindus believe that being burnt on a pyre beside the Ganges brings moksha, the ultimate emancipation, liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth. It is reckoned 32,000 human corpses are cremated here each year with up to 300 tons of half-burnt human flesh released into the Ganges. But it is the bodily waste of the living that is the biggest challenge here. The first Ganges action plan 30 years ago commissioned a series of huge sewage plants, but muscular infrastructure has not solved the problem. Studies show just 20% of the sewage produced along the Ganges is treated. The rest goes into the river, which is why faecal contamination here at Varanasi is almost 150 times the safe level for bathing. It helps explain one of the most shocking statistics of all about India, the fact that 300,000 children under five die each year from diarrhea. So what is Mr. Modi's clean Ganga mission doing about it? I've come to India's spectacular environment ministry, the nerve centre of Mr. Modi's efforts to clean the Ganges. So has the Indian Prime Minister bitten off more than he can chew? We are a thinking government under Narendra Modi and we learned we have taken lessons from the past mistakes and we have already corrected it. And therefore, there is a tremendous focus and he is leading from the front and therefore we are very confident that we'll achieve our targets. But what we're not seeing as we travel down the Ganges is concrete evidence of change. We are not saying that the whole Ganga mission will be complete in five years. No, five years will ensure that there is a marked difference. But it's a long project. Rhine and Thames were same dirty 50, 60 years ago, but they also took nearly 20 years to completely change the uh, overall uh, ecology of that. And we will also do achieve it. Let's hope he is right, because the Ganges sustains a unique ecosystem and one of the rarest animals in the world, the Ganges 
river dolphin. And what's more, they still survive in the main stretch of the river between the tanneries of Kanpur and the temples of Varanasi. We've come down to the Ganges and the hope was that we might be able to spot the incredibly rare Gangetic dolphin. And incredibly, within minutes of arriving here, I saw the dorsal fin of one of them break the water. Now the real challenge, I think, is gonna be filming them. We've hired a little boat, this is it. Got the boat going back, whoa. And this is Sanjay, the cameraman. Sanjay, how difficult do you think it's gonna to be to film the dolphins? We've seen a couple, haven't we? Yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite tough because they pop out suddenly. So this is Mr. Askar Nawab, and you are an expert on Gangetic dolphins. You work for World Wildlife Fund, and one of the programs is to protect this rare animal. How Absolutely. rare is the Gangetic dolphin now? The uh, Ganga River dolphin is an endangered species, and it's uh, uh, pretty uh, rare to uh, spot these animals. Oh, oh there's so many of them! But today, there seem to be dolphins all around us. Six, seven, seven simultaneously over there. Look, too big. They have to surface every two minutes or so to breathe. The challenge is guessing where they're going to be. Oh, it's just over here. You can actually see how close quarters we can get. But you also get a sense of how big they are. These are big animals. Again, over there, Sanjay. But after a bit, Sanjay gets his eye in, and then just look at this. But, oh my god, two of them just Oh, jumped. great, I've got one. Good man, that's really good. This has been extraordinary. I never expected to see anything like as many dolphins as we've seen. And it's such incredibly good news because what it tells us is that this river is capable of supporting these wonderful animals. And it also shows us what's at stake, why it's so important that the Indian government's efforts to clean up this river succeed. The last stage of our journey takes us to the mouth of the river at Ganga Saga. It is here the Ganges ends its 2,500 kilometer journey where it finally meets the ocean. This is another holy site. And we visit on one of the most auspicious of days. A million pilgrims have come here to celebrate the descent of the goddess Ganga from the heavens. The Indian Prime Minister knows he will be judged on what he achieves with the Ganges. It is a test of India's ability to become a modern nation. Because it means tackling corruption, introducing proper regulation, as well as massive investment in waste treatment. But Mr Modi has a key advantage. The fact so many Indians want him to succeed. And if India can clean up one of the dirtiest rivers in the world, who knows what else this great rising nation can achieve.